very special guest, a, a local person who um, has lived in Spring Arbor area all of his life, but I think we've got a, someone who's going to introduce him. You don't get to hear her voice very often, but you get to see her hands moving like crazy. Meg Holton. Good morning, SAU. So this morning, I have the special honor of introducing my father-in-law as today's speaker. Um, my husband and I, especially my husband as a son, and I have just been transformed by the Lord's love in his life. He's a lover of the outdoors, of farming, of people, and of history and music. But he's also really passionate about people and about mentoring and missions, and most of all, the Lord. So today he's coming to share with you a story of how the Lord's love is so much deeper than we could ever comprehend and how the faithfulness of his people and his love together is transformative, not just for one person, but for whole communities of people and ultimately the globe. So that's Todd. Todd, would you come and stand right here? We're going to pray for you. You stand with us. And if you'd like to come and lay hands on Todd, pray for our time, pray for him and the Lord's message that he will share with us. To close our prayer today, we have Heather Thompson, junior nursing major from Adrian, Michigan, also a spiritual life leader on campus. So let's lift our voices in prayer together. Heavenly Father, Dear sweet Jesus, thank you for this beautiful day that we can come together and worship you. Lord, I ask that you be with Todd and use him as a vessel to spread your word. Lord, um, I ask that we receive what it is that you want us to hear today. I ask you just quiet our bodies and just open our ears and our hearts to what it is you have to say. In your name, amen.
the taste of eternity. Right. 
name, there he is also. Do you believe Jesus Christ is here this morning? Do you believe Jesus Christ is here this morning? Yeah. Amen. I do. Well, as Brian said, my name is Todd Holton. I am husband of faith, father-in-law of Megan, and my other siblings, and I think my folks are here too. I heard is that true. Uh, there they are waving. So this is kind of a homecoming. This is going to be kind of a little bit difficult for me. So I, I want you to pray for me also. You know, it's like Jesus speaking in his hometown. But this is going to go okay. You're not going to stone me. So I think, I think we'll be all right. Got a couple of things I want to say before I start my story. How many believe this book? Do you know what this book is? The Bible. B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. Bible. You ever sing that when you were a kid? You know what it stands for? Biblical instructions before leaving earth. You all know that. Your professors taught you that. I'm sure. How can we know the Bible is true? How can we know, how can we believe the Bible? 
Well, it's actually pretty remarkable. It was written over 1,600 years by 40 different authors, three different languages, several different countries. And yet, over all that whole time, they all came down to the same theme. I don't know of any other book in history that can do that. Uh, I'm going to pick on somebody. Luke Hubbard, where are you at? Luke? Okay, Luke. Um, let's say Luke was born in 1880. He went to Spring Harbor College at the time. And let's say in about 1895, Luke says, okay, uh, I'm going to prophesy, and I, I think all this stuff's going to happen in the next hundred years. I'm going to say that we're going to have a thing called the automobile, the airplane, we're going to put a man on the moon, we're going to have two world wars, some assassinations of some presidents. And let's say all that came true. Wouldn't we believe Luke's book? Then why don't we believe the Bible? Skeptics have always talked about Scripture, and they, 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 they scrutinize it, and they don't believe it, and yet, and yet there are over 300 fulfilled prophecies of the life of Christ 400 years before he was even born. So I don't know about you, but I believe the Bible. And so we're going to read a little bit about it, <clears throat> about what the Bible says about heaven. Now, uh, there's just a, a few things that I want to I want to clear up right away. And that is, I love Spring Arbor University. My sister went here. I didn't go here, but my sister went here. My parents met here. My grandparents met here. A lot of friends that went here. And you are a good-looking bunch of folks. I just want to let you know. You are in a great place. And I just want to give kudos to Spring Arbor University this morning. It is a great place. God is here, and God is working. Four things I want you to get out of this message, that I, my story that I want you to, to hear. Number one, God is real. The Bible is true. Heaven is a place, and prayer is powerful and effective. Reading from Revelation chapter 21, I'm just going to read a few selective verses. The Bible says if you read Revelation, you will be blessed. It's the hardest book in the, in the Bible to read because there's just so many metaphors and just so much going on, and it's hard to grasp everything around it. So we're just going to dive into it just a little bit before I, before I speak. Chapter 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death, no more crying, no more pain. The old order of things have gone, the new has come. Then he carried me away to a high and lofty place and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out from heaven. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and with twelve angels at the gates. And the gates were written on the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. There were three gates to the east, three to the north, three to the south, and three to the west. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who walked with me and talked with me had a golden measuring rod. And we measured the city and its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a cube, as long as it was wide and high. And it measured to be 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles. And the walls were 216 feet thick. Now, why do I say all that? This picture you see up here was a painting that I had a, a university student here, uh, Beth McEwen, Beth Postenow, paint for me a few years ago. But this is something that happened to me many, many years ago. I'm a farmer, I work at Spring Arbor Lumber also, so I have a lot of outdoor stuff. And it was a time in my life that I just, I really, I knew God as a child, and yet uh, I, just, I just wanted some assurance for some reason. I just, you know, boy, it would be really cool to, to hear a little bit more about heaven. As a farmer, when you're planting, you, you cannot take your eye off your, your marker. Because if you do, what happens? You end up having crooked rows. And you don't want the neighbors saying how crazy that farmer is to have all those crooked rows. And so I'm looking, at my, I'm looking at my marker, as the picture shows, and, I'm, and for some reason I just happened to look up in the sky, and here's a beautiful, beautiful, bluest sky you've ever seen in your life, and two clouds are, are following each other from southwest to northeast, and one stops, and one bumps into the other one and backs up. And what I saw was two walls at a right angle. I know you can't quite see that because it kind of looks like the sun up there. 
But these walls had 12 specific rows of blocks. The clouds were white, the wall was whiter, and the dome on top was even whiter. And when I asked Beth to help paint that, she said, Todd, I can't. I can't paint white on white on white. And so she said, it's very difficult. So she said, I have to put some hues and some yellows. She said, it's probably going to look like the sun, but, but you'll get the idea. And I just stood there on my tractor with my hands in the air, with tears running down my face. I said, oh, Lord, thank you. I think you've given me a glimpse of the outside of heaven. Now, when I read Revelation now, and in the translation of the miles, with I think it's, it's pretty correct, I can, I can kind of envision 1,400 miles, okay? So you've got like uh, Detroit to Denver. Then you've got uh, North Dakota to Texas. The 1,400 miles high is a little more difficult. As we stand here on the ground, we're about 73 miles up to our atmosphere. And then it's 1,400 miles, so you've got to go beyond that. I truly believe that that is, that is the size, at least, that we know of, of heaven. And it is out there as, as, the, as the lunar probes keep going further and further out into our galaxies. You see those beautiful pictures coming back with those wild colors and those designs. I think that's just a glimpse of what heaven's going to look like. And I think it's out there. It's going to come back. It's going to come down to earth. We're going to have a new heaven, a new earth. And it's going to be great. Well, all that to start. Wow, I gotta, gotta really hurry. So, May 31st, 2015. I, uh, I worked at the lumberyard. It was a Saturday. I went to work, uh, had breakfast with some folks in the morning. I uh, went to work, went to Cabela's with another couple friends of mine in the afternoon. It was kind of rainy. Got home. It was late in the afternoon. And, and my wife and I said, uh, you know, let's just watch a movie. So we watched uh, Sherlock Holmes, one of, one of them, I forget, one or two. Good movie. We got done. It was getting late, and I said, well, we might as well just go to bed. So it was, it was later in the evening, probably 10, 30, 11 o'clock, and we're just laying there talking, and uh, I'm telling her a story, and um, the lights were off, and that, that was where the first miracle started. The first miracle was we happened to go to bed together at the same time. We don't always. I'm down watching TV or reading or vice versa, and, um, and we went to bed together at the same time. I was telling her a story about a man at work whose daughter was in a bad car accident. She walked away from the accident, completely totaled her car with only one little gash in her head. I finished the story. And then my wife said, she just heard, like a snore, like, like a gasp. And she said, he already fell asleep. He's already snoring. And if I'm tired, I can do that. But she heard it again. And she said, well, that doesn't sound right. So the third time she heard that, she flipped on the light and she watched my eyes rolled back into my head, and I was already turning pale. And that was it. And she said, oh, my word, this is the way it's going down. This is the way it's all going to end. So the first miracle was she heard my last breath. The second miracle was my second son, Philip, who works for the Jackson County Juvenile Detention Center, happened to be home. He worked second shift at the time. That was a godsend. He had gotten home. We live in an old farmhouse, has a grate in the floor. And she says, Phil, grab your cell phone, call 911. And get up here, dad is not responsive. And so he came right up, started CPR, and he did that for 12 minutes. Now, I don't know, how many here have taken CPR? A lot of you. Okay, so, you know, you know, staying alive, staying alive. Huh? All that song? That was my era, that's why I kind of like singing it. Uh, so he did that for 12 minutes, and that's, that's a lot of work. I don't know if you've done CPR, that's a lot of work for 12 minutes. And uh, the EMTs came, and pretty soon uh, they said, okay, we we're, we're, took him to the Jackson took him to the hospital, packed me in ice, put ice under my armpits and everywhere else. It's, it's not comfortable. And, and bring my body temperature down to 91.3 to help preserve organs and brain function and all. And there I laid for 10 days. And uh, this picture kind of just shows a little bit of, of, of what you look like when you're in that state. Um, it was a medically induced coma because they didn't want me to, to, to move or do much, you know, so there I was. Didn't know if I had any brain function. I, I couldn't respond to anything. And so they didn't know what happened. So this is just after midnight now. And right away, you know, the calls went out. Um, Nathan and Meg, they lived in Claire. They're on their way down. Um, my sister's coming in from Wisconsin. My other son uh, was there. And also my youngest son, Thomas, was down in Indianapolis and there. And he's, uh, he's coming up from southern Indiana. And so we're all trying to converge and, and pray. And pastors started to come. Friends started to come. I'm a believer in prayer, and I'm a believer in specific prayer, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. But as, as, the, as the day went on and we filled the, uh, 
we filled the room with, uh, with people. Um, I know one of my uh, comments from my second son was uh, to my wife was, Mom, why is everybody so positive? Why is everybody so upbeat? We don't even know if Dad's even going to live through the day or the night. And uh, he's having a hard time. And I love my wife's quote. She said, son, I know God can heal your dad. But even if he doesn't, we're going to trust him. And that takes a lot of faith. That's why I married faith, right? A little, little joke there. I had a question for you earlier. How many have ever met a dead person? Trick question. Everyone raise your hand right now. Thank you. You have. I was dead for 12 minutes, clinically dead. And a couple things happened while I was dead. And uh, this is so cool that I can tell this story right here. This is David Rupert. How many know David Rupert? I don't know you, you in the balcony, a lot of you up there. Okay. David Rupert was our music minister here at this church for several years. He uh, retired from here, and he was a pastor, and he went down to Illinois. And about 15, 10, 15 years before uh, I had my issue, uh, he passed away. The first thing I remember in this 12 minutes, I believe that I was dead. I was sitting right by David Rupert on a piano bench. And David looked right at me. And I looked right at him. Now, this is the part that's really hard to explain, and I'll just try to do the best I can. We were in a space, a large space, but you couldn't really physically see the walls. You couldn't really understand that there was a ceiling. Uh, I, I, was, I was sitting on a bench, so I didn't really feel necessarily the hard floor. But it was a place that was warm. It was white. It was bright. It was a place that just made you feel like, wow, I want to stay right here. This is, this is, this is where I want to be. David was playing a song on the piano, never looked at the piano, and the piano really kind of disappeared in all this white. All they could see is kind of the keyboard. And I'm sitting right beside him, and he's looking right at me, and he looked really well, and, and he was playing a song that I, I remembered as a kid. And, and yet, when I came two weeks later, I, I couldn't remember what it was. So I'm going to fast forward to that real quick. So his wife, after he passed away, lives here in Spring Arbor. And I don't know, if Ruth, if you're listening on the radio, but... Um, Ruth Rupert lives here in town with her daughter. And I said, Ruth, I got to see your husband while I was dead. And her first question was, how'd he look? I said, he looked great. I said, he had no white hair, no glasses. I said, he looked, you know, she had a picture of him in uniform uh, back in the 50s. I said, he looked pretty much like that guy right there. But I said, there's kind of an issue here. I said, he was playing a very fast song, and I don't know what song it was, and you guys were more classical. I know when he became a Christian back in the 50s, he kind of gave up kind of all his worldly music. And she got this big smile on her face, and she said, just a minute. She came back down. She said, here's a CD that when they retired from this church, they, uh, they made this CD of their favorite song. And so she said, I don't know if it'll help, but there's two fast songs on this, and number 11 was one of his favorites. So I went right home, and I popped it in the CD player, and, and chills just went up and down my body. That's the song that David was playing for me while I believe I was in heaven. And it's a fast-paced version of onward Christian soldiers marching as to war. You know that one? With the cross of Jesus going on before. And I just got the chills, and I just started to tear up. And I thought, wow, I got to hear some piano music in heaven from a guy that I know. And you know, all the theological questions I could have asked David while I was there, he's at the piano bench, and I'm looking at him, and you know what he said? David, this is really cool. What an idiot. I could have said, like, you know, what's your house like? What do you eat? Do you fly? Do you have wings? You know, all that cool stuff I could have asked him. No, this is cool. And it was cool. And I love that spot. I could have stayed there. But he didn't. So as soon as we were done with the music, that all went away. I was next transported back home. We have a farm in, in Concord out here just a few miles. This is a picture of myself when I had a little more hair. I can't tell. And this was my grandfather, who, uh, who he and I were really close. He was a tool and die welder. And uh, he moved up by us uh, when I was about oh, 14. And he taught me how to weld. He taught me how to use a torch, just grab a wrench and just start doing things. And so uh, this is the shop. And I, I wish I had a better picture, but this is our shop where we fix stuff in behind there to the right. So I'm walking up to the shop from the outside, and Grandpa walks out. And he looks not really, really young, but a lot younger than I remember when he passed away. And he said, Todd, how you doing? 
And I said, Grandpa, I'm doing great. How are you doing? He said, I'm doing good. And he, I put my arm around him, and I could feel him. He wasn't a ghost, you know. I mean, he, he actually had skin to him, and I just, I could feel him. And then he asked me the strangest question. He said, how's your grandson? How's Palmer? My, my grandson was five. My grandfather had been dead for 20 years. And I said, Grandpa, he is great. I said, you would love him. He is a 100% boy. I said, he is just, he is great. And we named him, the Palmer name is on his side of the family. My grandpa's grandma was Emma Palmer. And so it was, it was kind of a unique thing. Well, we were just there in a the moment, and, and I, I just, I loved him. I just wanted to stay there. And, and, and yet he, he always wore a watch. And I believe the Bible says a day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day. And I believe that. And I believe his watch was just a muse to get him out of there because we could have stayed there for a long time. He looked at his watch and he said, well, I got to go. But he says, we'll talk again sometime. I said, okay. And I turn, he turned and he walked back into the shop. And as he walked back into the shop, he got in there maybe 10, 15, 20 feet. He just kind of disappeared and just kind of broke away. I told that to some kids one time and they said, didn't that freak you out? I said, no. I said, it was my grandpa. I love my grandpa. And I said, I know I'll see him again. He told me I'll see him again. Fast forward again, after I woke up, one of the first things I wanted to do in the hospital was call my grandpa. I'd been on a lot of drugs, and a lot of things had gone on. And as the day wore on and my family was telling me, you know, this is, this is where you're at, this is what's going on, and this is what year it is, I'm thinking, I can't talk to my grandfather. He's been dead for 20 years. And then the thought hit me. What if he'd asked me, you want to come with me? Can, can I show you something? You, you want to come into the shop just, just for a minute? I'm convinced if, if I'd have walked two steps into that shop, I would not be here standing here today. I think he'd have ushered me right into heaven. But I think the Lord said, no, Linford, don't ask Todd to go. It's not his time. And he didn't. So what do you do with something like that, right? It's, uh, it's a little unnerving. So here's my body, I'm still there, I'm still unconscious, unconscious for 10 days. Doctors are saying, you know, this is not, this is not a good thing, he's not responding, no purposeful movement, he's not doing anything that we want him to do. And so they came to my wife and they said, uh, uh, Mrs. Holton, we've got some, some news. This is on a Thursday. They said the next 72 hours is going to be very crucial in his life because the next 72 hours is going to be the way he's going to be the rest of his life. And uh, our pastor's wife uh, was there, Linda Van Valen. She says, we need to start a prayer chain. We need to start it right now. And they had a sign-up sheet that uh, you, you could sign up for every half an hour slots, and many, many people did. And so uh, just within a few hours, all those slots were filled for the next 72 hours. So I had constant prayer. I'm going to jump to the next morning. So the next morning, Friday morning, a friend of mine who went to church here, our bishop, David Roller, who grew up here in Spring Arbor, who I knew really well, flew to Haiti. And I go to Haiti every year. been there 17, 18 times now. And I go to the same church, and we, we work with the same pastor, and he's just a great man of God. And, and our bishop, David Roller, was going to Haiti to lay hands on this pastor friend of mine, Pastor Deverest, to commission him to be, become Haiti's first free Methodist bishop. They've never had a bishop before. And then they're going to make their own general conference, their own bishop. And so he's laying his hands on Devery's, and, and we're in this big church, and Devery says, wait, before you pray for me, we have to pray for my friend, Mr. Todd, in Michigan. He's got some problems. What a man of God. This is his big day, their first bishop. This is not that particular time, because the church was actually packed, had two, 3,000 people there. So in that midst, they stopped and prayed for me. Wow. I said, that was just really, really cool. I'm told that it was that morning that I started to respond. The nurse said, squeeze my finger, or wiggle your toes, or they poked me with a pin, and I'd start to, start to move a little bit. And then as the days progressed, I got more and more and more active with those commands. I still, didn't, I still wasn't awake. That by, by Sunday night, uh, I was able to really, almost on any kind of command, do what they wanted me to do. On that next Wednesday, I woke up. Now, I don't know about you, you've been in a coma for a while, you've been to heaven, you, you've seen some things, and all of a sudden now you, 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 you're waking up. You think, wow, what is, what is going on here? And so it was quite a surreal, surreal moment, you know, and, and my, 
you know, my, my kudos to my family and my friends, those that prayed, uh, and to Megan, she is just a gem. She wrote on Caring Bridge website every day. She gave updates every day on what was going on, what was going on. And in the updates, she had a devotional. And you should read some of those devotionals. I said, how did you ever come up with that? And she says, Dad, she said, every night I would go and I would ask the Lord, what do you want me to say? And she said, I could feel the Holy Spirit come down and I just started to write. And so when you read those devotionals, you know it's not just from her, but it's from, it's from the Lord. So I'm just, just kind of there, just, just kind of waking up. And, and it's a great picture of my dad and my sister. I think they were just as happy to see me as I was to see them and, and, and my wife and all too. Um, so this is on a Wednesday. By, by Saturday, my wife said, he's got to rest. We've got to give him some time. I love people. And they were coming in and out of the room. I couldn't talk. I still had a ventilator and I had all kinds of stuff, tubes hanging in me. So she said, we're just going to let him rest. So this is actually after I woke up. So, so here I am on the sixth floor, Allegiance Hospital downtown. I'm looking down, I'm looking down uh, Page Avenue, and, and I'm looking at the Lily Missionary Baptist Church. You can see the steeple on the church way back in there behind there. And I don't know if I was awake, if it was a dream, if I was sleeping. It doesn't make any, or a vision. It doesn't make any difference. But, but I remember looking out that window and thinking back several years earlier. Spring Arbor University has a, a black gospel singer, Babby Mason. You know Babby? She comes here every year. She is a great gal. I love Babby. I knew Babby when she did her student teaching at Concord. So I've known her for years and years and years. She called me and she said, Todd, I need to make some platforms for a hometown video that I'm going to do with my mom at our church. And I said, sure. Her dad used to pastor here. And so I, we built these platforms. I built all this stuff for her. And I re, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking of all this that happened years earlier. And a song came that her and her mom sang. God's going to open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing and you will not have the room to receive it. That's the only part of that song I could remember. And when I finished that song, a forearm from about here down came out of the sky. It came right over the top of the little missionary Baptist church and was coming right for my room. And of all the times I had people in my room, I was by myself. I had tons of people all the time. But my wife says, let, let him sleep, let him rest. And there was nobody in the room. This was just just for me, God and me. As that hand came into my room, just about the time it hit the window, I was transported on top of the hospital and I could see all the flat roof and all the heaters and air conditionings and I watched that hand go right in the side of my window and as soon as it disappeared, I could feel this. I could feel a hand right on my heart, massaging my heart. And a still small voice says, Todd, I'm healing you 100%. I don't know what that does for you, but I tell you what, if you saw a hand coming at you, somebody asked me, did it have a hole right here? And you know, I wish I could remember, but I am convinced that it's the hand of God. And he healed my heart. My wife and I still are amazed that I had a SCD, sudden cardiac death. It was a mitral valve that blew, and I didn't have it operated on until November. And we got it fixed, and he fixed up the valve and just put a stainless steel ring around it and tied it together so it all holds. He says, your heart's fine. You'll die an old man of something else. But he said, he said a couple of things. He said, you had a lot of calcium deposits around your valve and a lot of calcium on your heart muscle. I said, what's that mean? He says, well, you would have been a great recipient for a total heart transplant in a few years. So I said, doc, you mean the thing that, that killed me saved my life? He said, yeah, I guess you could say that. It's just, it's just really crazy how God works. So it wasn't long, and I was, I was back, and, and things, were, things were progressing a lot faster. He said, I, I took you on as a patient, and Luke Hubbard's mom knows because she had the same thing I did, and she recommended this doctor in Ann Arbor, and so that's where I went. But um, he said, I took you on as a patient because what you had, I never see, because guys like you or women like you die before I get to see them. He said, you had about a 2% chance of survival. And of that 2% chance, you should have some type of brain damage or paralysis. No comment, Faith. And, and I didn't have any brain damage that I know of, and, and I, I don't have any paralysis, because I knew that the Lord healed my heart 100%. And I'm convinced of that. So where do you go for something like this? You know, 
what do you do? What do you say? I don't have the answers. You know, I'm a sinner saved by grace. God knows me in and out. He knows my faults. And yet he still loves me 100%. So I have a story because I, I, I died and lived to tell about it. But each one of you have a story. And I've heard hundreds and hundreds of stories since I've, I've had my experience. Little stories. People that say, the Lord's talking to me about talking to a friend of mine who was in high school that, that doesn't know Jesus. That's a story. Get to know God, believe the Bible, and tell your story. And, uh, and like I say, these, these four things are so critical in life. Don't let anyone ever tell you that the Bible's not true, that God is not real, that heaven is not a place, because it is. And prayer is powerful and effective. So tell your story. Let people know why you love Jesus Christ in your heart. And what does that do for not only you, but what does that do for others around you? My wife and I just returned from the Holy Land with a group from church here just a week and a half ago. And we saw God at work. We saw Christians on the front line in Amman, Jordan, that are, are standing up for their faith, even under heavy persecution. We're pretty comfortable here in the United States. We have it pretty, pretty easy. We don't have that persecution, and they do. And yet they're, they're really on fire for the Lord. So I would say look for, look for that, look for that uh, opportunity to give your story and to share. And then also make sure you're reading this book and make sure that you're memorizing some of these scriptures. The Lord delights in us fellowshipping with him daily. Find a scripture that you want to emulate and then live it. And I'll just tell you mine. It's found in Romans chapter 12, 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourself. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be patient in hope, joyful in affliction, be joyful in prayer, and practice hospitality. That's what I'm trying to emulate in my life. And I, and I hope you find a verse, cling to it, stick to it, and then go, go out for Jesus. I love you all. Thank you and God bless. So in the spirit of Thanksgiving, um, Todd's story is a great reminder that we don't know um, what may come in our lives, that each day we need to appreciate both the Lord's grace for us, his love for us, appreciate the people who are around us, uh, and that as we appreciate those things, that we can become a witness in living in such a way that we would uh, be a light for, for the gospel. And so I pray that will be your week, that whatever you are looking forward to in Thanksgiving, whether it's the turkey and the turkey coma, a little bit of football, uh, maybe just some time with family, would you um, honor the Lord in the way that you give thanks? So let me pray us out of here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, uh, for life. We thank you for miracles. We thank you for the way that you speak to each one of us through our life circumstances, through ways that we could never comprehend. And we pray that in this week as we uh, are together with family and friends, uh, that you would help us to be thankful for the life you've given us, for the new life you've given us in Jesus Christ, that we may respond that we may respond in such a way that we would help others be grateful for their lives as well. For we ask this in Jesus' name.